may be seated. Amen. During the week, um, I like to go to the gym and uh, attend an exercise class every day with another group of people. And uh, there's a trainer there that kind of tortures us during the day. And so one of the um, one of the exercises that the trainer asks us to do on occasion is what's called a farmer's carry, and it's. It's really simple. You get a couple of dumbbells. I don't know as, as much as you want to pick up. You pick them up and you begin to walk. And you just start walking around the gym and walking around the gym, carrying the dumbbells. And you may think to yourself, well, that's not hard. Only the people that have never tried it say that that's not hard. It's not hard to start with because you kind of settle in and you walk. But the further you walk, the heavier those weights get. And at some point, you stop and you drop the weight with sweat dripping off your chin and off your head because after a while, the weights are just too hard to carry any further. I can't help but think that that describes so many of us today because of what's happened to us in our lives or because of a decision or something that we've made we are left with weight on us that we're carrying in our life it's a burden it's it's the results of what's happened to us whether it's happened to us or whether we've caused this to happen it's the result of what's happened and we have made an agreement with ourselves that life is just going to be like this from now on that this is as good as it's going to get and we might as well adjust to carrying this weight because there's no way that this weight can come off anymore that my friends is a lie because the God that we've been singing about has issued us this invitation. Come to me, all of you who labor and are carrying heavy weight, and I will give you rest. And so for our prayer time this morning, that's exactly what I wanna do. I want to give you an opportunity to bring that weight to Jesus and drop it. So this morning for our prayer time, I'm going to do something that we don't usually do here. I am going to designate the front of this church right here, this plain old place, as a sacred place where symbolically and spiritually you can meet with Jesus and make an exchange. As we begin to pray, I'm going to issue an invitation to you. If you're carrying some kind of weight in your life I'm gonna invite you to just stand up from where you're sitting and walk down to the front and you can either stand or kneel and when you come down here you're gonna do some spiritual business with Jesus you are going to literally drop your weight into his hands right here right now now this is a this is more than symbolic. This is a spiritual step of faith where you can leave today lighter and freer than you've ever been before. You might think, well, people will see me. Yeah, they might. But you know what? You're not going to be by yourself because we all carry weight. And anybody that wants to I'm just offering you a chance to drop whatever it is you're carrying and let Jesus free you of what you've been carrying. Now, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and bow your head for a moment. 
God, right now, we have a chance at freedom and the lifting of the weight that has accumulated in our life. Would you give us the courage and the faith to take you up on your offer? And now as I wait for just a moment, any and all that would like to come and drop their weight, I'll wait for just a moment. I don't care what it is that you're carrying. I don't care how heavy it feels. This is a chance for you to say, Jesus, I don't want to carry this anymore. And I can't. They're coming from everywhere. And so this is your chance to come along with them. Will you come and drop off the weight that you've been carrying? Anybody else? Okay, if you're down here at the front, kneeling or standing, don't just kneel or stand and close your eyes and wait for me to say something. You're here because you have brought something to Jesus. For a moment, in the quietness of your heart, drop your weight and give him what you're carrying. Father, life is so heavy sometimes. We carry weight, some not of our own choosing, some because of what we have accumulated ourselves. And it's so heavy. And it's defeating. And we're tired. And we're sick of going on like this. And so all across the front of the church, my Father, are men and women who are bringing to you those things in our life that are too heavy to carry anymore. Jesus, I remind you, not that you needed to be reminded, but we say it with our mouth. You invited us to bring those heavy weights to you, and you promised to give us rest. And so right now, we open our hands and we release those things that we have been carrying and we give them over to the one who can carry all the weight for us, the one who died for us, the one who loves us more than we can ever understand. And Jesus, along with this releasing of the weight, comes a new resolve to follow you closer, to walk with you deeper, to be more devoted to you than ever before. I thank you that you are the God of freedom. And we remember that the Bible says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And so today, we rejoice in the freedom that Jesus Christ gives us. And we thank you in the name of the one who died for us, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's some free people walking back to their seats today, I just want you to know. I'm seriously considering just quitting and going home because that's about as much as we need to do today. <laughs> hey, I'm glad you're here. We're in the second week of our character study of the life of David. Remember last week, David was anointed as the next king of Israel while only a boy, a shepherd boy. I, uh, I, I tried to imagine all the talented adults 
living in Israel who were in line for this kingship. I mean, there were seasoned war veterans and, and diplomats who could have served as the king. But instead, God chose a servant boy, not because of his intellect or, the, or his looks or anything else. It was because of the contents of his heart. David was a man after God's own heart. And so this morning's topic, David is still a boy, and this is probably the best known and best loved story of the entire Bible, maybe, the story of David and Goliath. I know you've heard it before a hundred times and from pastors way more talented than me. And you may be thinking, well, I just don't know why I came today because I heard all this before. But don't check out just yet because chances are you're in a different place in life now than when you heard it before. And God has this way of taking familiar scripture and finding a new way to apply it directly to where we are today. Now we're going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17. Got a lot of scripture and so I'm going to be moving along because I want to make sure that we get all of this in today. The story between David and Goliath um, begins at verse 1 of 1 Samuel 17. And the first three verses of the chapter set the stage for what we're about to read. Here's what the Bible begins, how the Bible begins the story of David and Goliath. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko in Judah and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. This is the battlefield that where the story unfolds. The battlefield is actually a valley where there's hills on one side. It's not a steep ravine, it's a long valley almost a mile wide and on the other side is the other army the the philistines on one set of hills then the valley and then the israelite army on the second verse four then goliath a philistine champion from gath came out of the philistine ranks to face the forces of israel he was over nine feet tall he wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you're only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. It's hard to exaggerate how intimidating this giant must have been. I am uh, over six feet tall, and when I raise my hand completely up, it's eight feet right here. Goliath is over nine feet tall. Imagine having to face someone like this. He was a champion or representative of the Philistine army. And what he was suggesting was a common battle tactic in the Old Testament times. Each army would select one champion 
or one representative, and those two would fight a virtual war. And the purpose was to settle the dispute or settle the battle without engaging a large amount of soldiers, thus saving both armies a lot of bloodshed. And whichever champion won the battle would win the war for his side, and the losers would be servants to the winners. So the future of the Israelite nation hung in the balance with this giant. Have you ever felt like a giant was standing in your way, threatening to wipe you out? Now, you might, be, you might not be facing a literal giant with armor, but let's be truthful. Our lives have giants in them too, don't they? Just as big, just as strong, and just as intimidating. Some people's giants take the form of a difficult medical diagnosis. One visit to the doctor, and off the pages of the test report jumps this nine-foot-tall giant that's suddenly threatening you. Some people's giant is a boring, frustrating, dead-end job. You feel trapped. You can't change anything. Or maybe your giant is an uncontrolled habit or temptation that rises up and washes over you with no warning. You feel helpless to battle. And like the Israelite army, maybe you feel hopeless and defeated. You know, the giants in our lives have some common characteristics. Let me give you some characteristics of giants. First, the giants in our lives are frightening. When the Israelites saw Goliath, they were absolutely terrified. They ran away and hid in their tents. And it wasn't only the soldiers. The king was terrified as well. I can imagine Goliath's booming voice calling the Israelites every name in the book, making fun of them. And don't our giants do the same thing to us? We're intimidated. We're afraid. And we feel defeated before the battle even starts. Giants are frightening. They're also relentless. Verse 16 says that for 40 straight days, Goliath came out and taunted the Israelites. Morning and evening, day after day, giants never shut up. They never let up. They're the first thing you see in the morning. They're there with you all day. They're the last thing you see when you close your eyes to go to sleep at night. They never leave us alone. Giants are also invincible. At least they appear to be invincible. Look at Goliath, a bronze helmet, chain mail, shin guards, sword, a spear, an armor bearer. You look at that kind of giant who looks like they have no weakness. And have you noticed that your giants often look that way as well? We look at the giants in our life and we say to ourselves, there's no way. And then fourth, giants must be faced. As tempting as it would have been to ignore Goliath or just simply run away and retreat as an army, That wasn't an option. We can't ignore our giants either because to give in to giants is to be defeated by giants. There was no one, including the king, who would step forward and face down this giant. No one, that is, until the shepherd boy, David, came along. Verse 12. Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, an Ephrathite from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at the time, and he had eight sons. 
Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shemiah, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three older brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they're doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd. And he set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. David was unaware of the impending battle. He wasn't there to fight. He was just there as a messenger. But when he arrived and he heard Goliath threatening and intimidating the Israelites. And when he saw that no one, including the king, was brave enough to stand up against this giant, that's when the story gets good. Verse 23. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempt from paying taxes. That would be enough to get some people going, wouldn't it? <laughs> now verse 32. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear <clears throat> comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Amen. So the shepherd boy does what the soldiers were too afraid to do. And the shepherd boy does what the king was too afraid to do. He accepted the challenge. And now this is where I want us to enter the story. Because now the scripture begins to tell us how David prepares himself to fight a giant. And that's what we need this morning. We know, we need to know how to prepare ourselves to fight the giants in our lives. So as we go through the rest of this chapter, I want to point out four principles that we can learn to fight the giants in our lives. You ready? Principle number one, be ready for criticism 
when you fight. Verse 29. I'm sorry, verse 26. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. Yes, they said, the reward for, this is a reward for killing him. Now verse 28, and get this. But when David's older brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. And what about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and your deceit. You just want to be seen in the battle. Listen, when a giant appears in your life and you stand up in faith to fight it, don't be surprised if other people criticize you for thinking you can stand up and fight a giant. In the David story, his criticism comes from his older brother, who was no doubt jealous of his younger brother. Look how David's brother attacked him. First, he attacked his motives. He said, why have you even come down here anyway? The insinuation was that David was only there to bring attention to himself. And then came the humiliation. Who's looking after your little flock of sheep, little boy? And then came bitterness and ugliness. I know how conceited you are, and I know how wicked your heart really is, your bro his brother implied. You're here just to see the battle, and there's a possibility that the Hebrew translation of this verse can say, you have come down to be seen in the battle. And as you face the giants in your life, and as you prepare to do battle, don't be surprised if the people that you thought you could count on the most, like your family or your closest friends, misinterpret your motives or react in mockery. You can't defeat this habit. You'll never get on top of your weight problem. You can't, why are you even trying to do this? Or my favorite, you're too far gone. Oh my goodness. You know, this makes me think of Job. Do you remember Job's giant in his life? Job's giant was struggling to trust God in the middle of a personal disaster. Remember the loving advice that Job got from his wife and his friends? They said, hey, your attitude isn't right. You must have some secret, unconfessed sin, and that's why you're suffering. You need to just curse God and die. At the time that Job needed support and love, he got derision and judgment. Listen, if you're facing a giant and you're fighting your heart out, don't let naysayers, don't let doubters distract you from the fight. Chances are they don't even understand. Keep your attention and keep your focus on God and the giant. That's the first principle. The second principle is this. Small battles prepare us for big wars. I'm not going to read this scripture again, but we talked about this last week. When David was out in the fields just tending his sheep as a little boy, he wasn't just sitting at the grass, in the grass, looking at the clouds. God was preparing him to fight. Because of lions and bears, because of the difficulties in his life, David learned how to use a spear and a sling and a club. David learned courage when confronted by wild animals that were bigger than he was. And here's what I believe might have been David's most important lesson. Faith. David learned. That God knew how to protect him. 
no matter what he faced. And my friends, there are going to be times in your life, and maybe that time is right now for you, when you feel like David. You've been sent out into the field, away from where the action is, away from where you want to be, and you've given the exciting, you've been given the exciting task of watching over some sheep. It's boring. Where you are in life is frustrating. And it feels like you're going nowhere. But learn from David's life. It's in the boring times and the frustrating times that we learn the skills to fight the bigger battles down the road. Do you feel like you're in a dead end job? Maybe God is teaching you the discipline of commitment. Are you working for somebody that's a jerk or a know-it-all? Maybe God is teaching you how to submit to authority. Is your marriage relationship struggling just a little bit? Maybe God is trying to teach you the skill of never giving up. Or how to humble yourself and apologize and own your own stuff. You might be frustrated with where you are in life right now. But I promise you that every circumstance in your life has a purpose. Every frustration in your life has a lesson. And the battles you're facing and fighting right now are simply preparation for what God will have you face and defeat in the future. Be ready for criticism when you fight. Small battles prepare us for big war. And here's the third principle of fighting giants. Wear your own armor. Verse 38. Then Saul gave David his own armor. A bronze helmet, a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what things, what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream. And he put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Let me remind you how the Bible described King Saul. This is from 1 Samuel 9. There was a Benjaminite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man. His son, Saul, was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. Here was Saul, maybe approaching even seven feet tall himself putting his armor on a half-grown kid named David. I have a surprise for you this morning. I ran across rare footage of actual footage of David trying on Saul's armor. Now, this video is grainy, but remember, it's thousands of years old. Look at David trying out Saul's armor. (laughs) Down he goes. Here's the principle. When you're fighting a giant in your life, you're going to have people from all sides trying to give you advice on what to do next. They're going to tell you stories of how they fought 
their giants, what worked for them. And they're going to start telling you what you ought to be doing. In other words, they're going to ask you to wear their armor. And you're going to feel like you have to treat your giant in the same way they did. It's so tempting to try to fight battles with somebody else's armor on, but don't be afraid to wear your own armor. Be yourself. Use the experiences and the tools that God has given you. Instead of wearing armor like Saul, David used what God gave him. See, while in the fields with the sheep, God taught him how to use a sling. So what did David do? He walked over to the brook and he picked up five smooth stones and he started out toward the giant. David didn't need a cannon. He didn't need a hand grenade. He didn't use a taser or anything else. All he needed was what God had already given him a sling and a stone. Use whatever God has equipped you with and don't worry about trying to please other people when you fight your giants. And then the fourth principle. Fighting giants is a spiritual battle. Verse 41. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come to me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you. And I will, cut, I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I'll give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. But not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. The more I picture this scene in my mind, the more amazed I am at what David was doing. This massive creature ready to smash him. And there David stood without fear and without intimidation. And there are the two words, fear and intimidation these are the emotions that giants create in us when we see a giant in our life we get intimidated and we get afraid and we stop thinking clearly and we get confused and our faith melts away and we forget how to pray because we're focused on the size of the giant and the odds against us. But God has given us weapons, hasn't he? Yeah. In addition to the life experience weapons he has given us, I want to remind you that he has given us potent weapons in the form of specific promises from his word I've brought only three to you today, but they're three good weapons from 2 Corinthians. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. That's a weapon to fight a giant with, isn't it? 
from Acts 1-8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You won't be a wimp. You will receive power. And from 2 Peter, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness and giants. David reached into his bag and pulled out a stone. He calmly loaded that stone in a sling. And just like the Lord taught him out in the field a thousand times before, he swung the stone and he let it fly. That's all David did. And God did the rest. And down came the giant. How could David stand unafraid and unintimidated in the face of this giant? David's eyes weren't on the giant. His eyes were fixed on God, and his mind was filled with God's promises with invincible confidence in his God, David was able to look straight in the eyes of the giant and say, the battle is the Lord's. And my friends, that's the secret to defeating a giant. I wonder how many of you are facing a giant in your life and you're trying to fight your own battle. You're trying to outthink it. You're trying to outwork it. Or you're trying to outspend it. Are you ready to consider the fact that you can't defeat your giant by yourself? You can't. But our God can. And God is saying to you, do it my way and do it with me. And together we can bring this giant down. Fighting giants is a spiritual battle. And the battle is the Lord's. So, What's your giant? Maybe it's time to stop for just a minute and be honest and admit there's a giant in my life. It's there. Have you named your giant? Have you had the courage to say, you know, this is more than a problem in life. This is a giant. Maybe for you it's your job. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a lawsuit or a habit. Or maybe it's a secret from your past. Maybe it's a fear of something in your future that just sucks the life and the faith right out of you every time you think about it. If you have a giant, then this is what God is saying to you right now. All I ask of you is to pick up the weapons that I have given you and have faith in me. God is saying, I'll take it from there. You don't have to wear somebody else's armor. You don't have to fight like anyone else. The battle isn't yours. It's mine. My friends, Don't be confused about this fact. David threw the rock, but God killed the giant. 
And this isn't a story about a giant. This is the story about a God who can kill any giant that exists. Including yours. Just one more time so you won't forget. Let me remind you what David said to that giant before he threw the rock and before God killed him. David said this, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear, because this is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. I'm wondering if you wouldn't like a chance to say those words to your giant. No, your giant might not be a a warrior named Goliath, but he's real or she's real. But again, this is not a story about giants. This is the story about a giant killing God who is ready to do to your giant exactly what he did to Goliath. Hey, would you bow your head and close your eyes with me for just a moment? I'm going to give you just a moment, just a moment, to do some business with God. Would you be willing to admit that there's a giant in your life? And would you be willing to begin fighting that giant in the name of the Lord, to just simply Use what he's already given you, but change your whole battle tactic and allow God to fight for you. My father, there are giants in our land, and there are giants in our lives, and they mean to bring us down. They're intimidating, they appear invincible, They are relentless, and we cannot walk away from them and ignore them. We must fight. Thank you, Father, that there has never been a giant you cannot completely and utterly destroy. And so for all of us who are fighting, I pray that you would show to us and remind us that this is not our battle You are a giant killing God, and the battle is the Lord's. I pray that you would teach us to fight the spiritual battle instead of beating our head against the wall in defeat. We trust you, and we thank you for fighting for us. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, I want to say thank you again for coming today. Here's our prayer team assembled and ready to pray for you or someone that you know. If you would like that, just make your way down. Thank you for remembering your tithes and offerings on your way out, and I hope you have a great week, and I want to see some some dead giants next week. What do you say? Let God wipe them out for us. God bless you. Have a great week.